Our program today on Brazil-U.S. relations with U.S. Ambassador Brazil, Todd Chapman, and Brazilian Ambassador to the United States, Nestor Forster. Um, it's going to be cool. Our program is sponsored by YKK America and is co-hosted by the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce Southeast. I want to welcome people in the audience as you're joining. I know people are still joining us. But I'm killing a little bit of time, but a special welcome to Carlos Abreu, who is the Consul General of Brazil in the southeastern U.S., when I emailed Carlos to tell him we had a program set up with Ambassador Chapman, he immediately suggested that he would uh, invite Ambassador Forster and so we could have both ambassadors on and that worked out much more smoothly than I thought it would. So thank you very much, Carlos. We also have World Affairs Council board members, Eric Joyner, Jim Reed, Sam Olins on, Lucia Jennings, who's the president and CEO of the Brazil American Chamber of Commerce Southeast is on. Alex Gregory, who is the former CEO of YKK America and still a board member of YKK America, is joining us. And Sonia Beckelheimer, Director of Public Affairs for Latin America from UPS. Jim Reed, who is a member of our board, but is also the CEO of YKK America, is going to introduce the two ambassadors. So Jim, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Shapiro. Yes, my name is Jim Reed. I'm president of YKK Corporation of America, and YKK is a manufacturer of many things, including zippers and uh, snaps and buttons, but uh, we're operating around 70 countries around the world, um, and uh, Atlanta is the headquarters for our Americas division, so we have factories running from Canada to Argentina. Uh, including Brazil and the United States. Uh, we, were, we came to Brazil in 1972, and we currently have 500 employees manufacturing there. Came to the United States in 1960, and uh, just shy of uh, 3,000 there. So we're very honored to have both of you here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, speaking today, we have the Brazilian ambassador to the United States, probably the gentleman with the coolest name, in all Foreign Service Corps around the world, Ambassador Nestor Forster, which had to have been come out of some spy novel somewhere. I'm sure he'll tell us <laughs> about that later. And he was appointed to uh, his post, his current post in 2020, but has a career of uh, a foreign and governance service, including Costa Rica, postings in the United States, Canada, um, as well as uh, in the president's office and chief of staff to the Brazilian attorney general. Also, we have the U.S. Ambassador to Brazil, Todd, Ambassador Todd Chapman, also a career foreign service with uh, postings in Costa Rica, Bolivia, Mozambique, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Brazil, Taiwan, including Ecuador, where he also served as ambassador there. Uh, ambassador Chapman will tell us what is more dangerous, posting in the Washington, D.C. or posting in Kabul? So if you can explain that to us later, we would appreciate it. These gentlemen have very rich careers, uh, but I know you want to talk, hear more from them. So with that, I will kick it back to Ambassador Shapiro. Thank you, Charles. That's great. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, and, and I want to thank both ambassadors for joining us today and welcome you both. It's going to be a great program. Let, let, me, let me start with you, Ambassador Forster. Um, First of all, I, you're running a virtual embassy in Washington. I, how is that? And, and can you start off, I, I apologize. How many staff do you have in Washington and how many consulates does Brazil have around the US? Well, thank you, Ambassador Shapiro. I'd like just to briefly thank the World Affairs Council of Atlanta for the opportunity to be in this conversation with my great friend, Ambassador Chapman uh, this morning with all the members of, of the council. Uh, I also wanna thank Jim Reed and uh, YKK for supporting this program. And also to put a good word for my colleague, Ambassador uh, Carlos Henrique Abreu, who facilitated uh, our participation here. Thank you very much to our Consul General uh, in Atlanta for that. So uh, replying to your question. So we have a, a, an interesting footprint of Brazil here in the United States. We have the embassy in Washington, of course, and then we have 10 consulates around the country distributed more or less evenly uh, geographically. Concentration on the, on the East Coast, and then we have Los Angeles, San Francisco, and then a couple in the middle, Houston and, and Chicago. And of course, you know, on this side here, Miami, uh, Atlanta, uh, here in Washington, 
and then we have uh, New York, Hartford, and, and Boston. I think that covers all the bases. Now, yeah, we've been running an operation here. I had COVID at the, at the get-go. I had the, the dubious honor of being a pioneer in this regard. Fortunately, I had a, a mild case and uh, we haven't had a, another case in our embassy, which is about uh, 120 people strong. And we, we are glad about that. So we've been trying to do you know, creative things in terms of keeping a certain presence uh, at the embassy, but at the same, at the same time working as much as we can virtually and uh, let, let me tell you, I'm a, a career diplomat of 36 years, and I think uh, Todd shares this experience that, you know, I was in a point where I was starting to complain about having too many events and receptions and dinners and so on. And uh, now after one year of this, I'm ready to engage in any in-person event that you can imagine. <laughs> Ambassador Chevin, let me ask you, I mean, diplomacy is a I mean, I'm a retired diplomat and I consider it a, you know, face-to-face -face kind of business, having breakfasts and lunches, going to events at night. I mean, what, what is it, what is virtual diplomacy like? I mean, since you've arrived in Brasilia, you've had a virtual embassy. Not even, have you met all of your staff? Uh, Ambassador Shapiro, you're absolutely right. This is a different way to do diplomacy. And let me just also say what a pleasure it is to be with you again. I worked for Ambassador Shapiro 15 years ago when I was a mid-level officer in Washington. And I'm sure it's kind of strange for him to see me sitting in the ambassador's chair 15 years later. But what a, what a privilege to be with you, Charles, again, and to see your great success there in Atlanta. I too want to also send my greetings to Jim. Thank you for sponsoring this event and for all the members of the World Affairs Council and all that you do to bring the Southeast United States closer to the world. And I'd also like to give a shout out uh, not only to my good friend, Ambassador Forster, who is just an ideal partner as we seek to maximize benefits for our two countries with this relationship, but also to Ambassador Carlos Abreu, who I've known for many years and I didn't realize was in Atlanta. So Atlanta, you're very fortunate to have one of Brazil's finest there. It is very unusual, Charles, to run an embassy when you haven't met most of your staff. We have four consulates, one embassy office in Belo Horizonte, and then the embassy. And I have 1,500 staff, about 450 Americans, a little over 1,000 Brazilians. And I have not met 90% of the people that work for me. And that's a very strange thing. Uh, for an extrovert like me, it's very unusual to not to have the opportunity to be going around and slapping people on the back and talking about soccer and all of that. Uh, I'm speaking to you from home. This is a converted bedroom into my office. And it's just a different way to do business. But what it has done, as Ambassador Forster alluded to, is, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a city that has well over 130 ambassadors. And that means 130 national days. And you don't have national day events to go to. So you do find yourself having a lot more time than you often do because the press of public engagements are not as great. But what it has allowed me to do, Charles, is, is probably sink in more into the Brasilia environment of working closely with the Brazilian Congress and, of course, with the president and his ministers, because they, too, are not out and about traveling like they normally would. And President Bolsonaro and his government has just opened their doors wide open to me for which I'm very grateful. And that's allowed us to pursue a number of very important initiatives during my 14, 15 months here in Brazil. Great, that's a great introduction. And Todd, let me assure you that uh, when we worked together 15 years ago, I was sure you would end up being ambassador. To Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Okay, Ambassador Forster, I mean, everybody's talking about COVID in India at least in the US media and is, is ignoring Latin America and, and Brazil. But in percentage terms, COVID is actually having a bigger impact in Brazil than in India. There are 455,000 deaths, including a, a, around a thousand a day. Um, what, what's, what's the latest? What, what is this doing to Brazil and Brazilian society? Well, it's been a big challenge, I think, for everyone in every country. Uh, in Brazil, you know, if, if you think uh, uh, the number of cases and the number of uh, fatalities uh, uh, as a proportion to our population, it's not, uh, not as bad as, as it looks uh, up front. But it's a, it's a dire situation, many challenges for our health system. 
And uh, the government has been very active in, in trying to work on two fronts, uh, uh, Ambassador Shapiro. One of them, uh, of course, first and foremost, is the, the health crisis. And uh, you know, we, we have uh, had a, a vaccination campaign for which I, I don't think we have uh, received that due credit. Uh, Brazil has uh, 38,000 posts of vaccination around our very big country. And we have distributed over 90 million doses of vaccines. And uh, we are you know, doing everything we can. There's a big effort, including from our embassy, from our uh, uh, officers uh, uh, around the world in trying to bring more uh, vaccines to Brazil so we can do even more. Uh, right now we are you know, approaching 1 million dos doses a day of uh, vaccination. We, want, we have the capacity to do 2.4 million. I heard that from the Minister of Health himself. And uh, we are counting with uh, our American friends. You know, we, we bought 200 million doses on Pfizer. 38 million from Jensen, and uh, we are working to see ways to expedite that delivery. There's also, you know, you, you heard President Biden yesterday in his public speech announcing that the U.S. will be ready to, to bring uh, 80 million doses to countries that need, and we think that Brazil is, uh, should be up in that list, you know, for, for health considerations, if, if not for, for others. So, you know, uh, the effort is going on. One thing that makes us uh, proud of is that you know, among vulnerable groups, we always talk about the elderly, we talk about uh, healthcare workers, and we also talk about the indigenous peoples. And Brazil took a decision, a political decision, to have the, our indigenous communities receiving the vaccine first. So if you consider that, you know, the Amazon is about uh, eight times the great state of Texas, where Ambassador Chapman comes from, you know, it's a bit of a, a challenge to vaccinate people who are spread out in such a vast territory in remote areas and so on. And we have, uh, we have uh, uh, reached over 70% of those populations have already been fully vaccinated, receiving uh, both doses of vaccines. So, you know, th there are some uh, positive things uh, being done. And uh, I said, this is one front. The other front, of course, the economic uh, uh, challenges that we have due to the COVID. And, uh, you know, the federal government has done incredible things in terms of transferring, uh, uh, doing tra cash transfers directly to those who are most in need in Brazil. And that has gone a long way in, in terms of, you know, keeping uh, people afloat. And uh, we are seeing the rebound in economic activity, job generation and so on, job, job creation. And uh, we expect more of that uh, going forward as the numbers improve in the, in the coming weeks. And, and I'm going to in, interject here that uh, when you talk about the number of doses, it's in a population of 210 million. Is that correct, Brazilians? 220 million, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Ambassador Chapman, what... It's one thing for the president to give us for President Biden to give a speech. How do you turn that into action? I mean, the United States has shifted from vaccine scarcity to a vaccine surplus. What what can we do more to help in Brazil? Uh, Charles, the the United States has a strong tradition of working with Brazil on public health matters. Uh, the HIV/AIDS programs that uh, we've had here for over twenty years through the PEPFAR program, very important in the way that we work with the Ministry of Health of Brazil. Our CDC, based there in Atlanta, has had an office inside the Ministry of Health for over 20 years. And there's no other country that, that has that kind of relationship with Brazil. So we've worked through uh, crises, uh, health-related crises with Brazil before. HIV AIDS, then we worked on the Zika struggles of five or six years ago. And NIH has uh, over $100 million a year of, of joint research projects with Brazilians uh, that they're working on a wide range of, of health issues. So the idea of cooperating with Brazil in a health crisis is nothing new. And it's those relationships that have proved especially important as we collaborate together with the health institutions of Brazil to figure out ways that we can help and the ways that we can learn. Brazil has been a very important partner all through last year as we were doing the trials on various US vaccines. Brazil was a very good partner with us. And something I learned when I got here, Charles, was that Brazil is a especially attractive place to do vaccine testing because of the tremendous diversity of Brazil, both ethnically, geographically. You have large communities from all over the world here in Brazil. So it's a great place for us to do that kind of research together. Now, we are cooperating very closely on the issue of vaccines. As Ambassador Forrester mentioned, US companies now have contracted for 238 million 
doses by the end of the year. Uh, that's enough for 138 million adults in Brazil, of which that's most of them. And so we're very glad to be cooperating with them in that fashion. Because of our very important decisions we made about sourcing vaccines, we now are in a position as a US government to have excess vaccine. And so we are working in Washington to figure out the best way to deploy these. We hope to be able to help Brazil in some way uh, in the short term. We provided several, like about $30 million worth of assistance uh, across the board during this crisis that American companies have provided three times that amount in terms of assistance to Brazil. So the partnership is alive, it's well, we're working well together and we hope to be able to continue in the coming months to even assist further with vaccines. Okay, just shifting just a little bit, uh, just a question for both of you. Uh, President Bolsonaro and President Trump were especially close. How, how has it been difficult for you both of you as ambassadors to shift, uh, as you've shifted to the Biden administration and, and, and is the Biden administration resentful? Or, I mean, how, how does that work? I mean, you're professional diplomats with decades of service. How does that affect you when you change from two presidents with a very close personal relationship to a, to a new president? Mm -hmm. I'll jump on that one first. Um, of course, President Trump and President Bolsonaro had a very close uh, relationship in that they spoke often, and they came from similar points of view on a wide range of issues. And the relationship between U.S. and Brazil, while it's always been positive and constructive, as somebody that I've spent 12 years of my life in Brazil, first coming here in 1974 as an adolescent at, at age 11, and so I've been able to witness this relationship for much of my life. It's always been one that we've always thought could have been a lot better. And I think we saw a lot of that happen uh, between President Trump, uh, former President Trump and President Bolsonaro. But I think what's important to note, and, and Charles, you know this from your own experience, we, we are used to working through changes of administration. I'm now working for my sixth US president. And whenever that happens, especially from party to party, there's a moment of transition. And it takes a little while for the new US administration to get settled, to get their key people in place, and then to figure out the kinds of changes they wanna make. And I had the privilege uh, when I was here as deputy chief of mission, Charles, from 2011 to 14, I received then Vice President Biden to Brazil twice in 2013 and 14. And he was instrumental in helping to build bridges with then President Dilma Rousseff when our bilateral relationship was experiencing some strain. So I've told people that I'm fortunate that I now have a president that knows Brazil better than any incoming president, probably in our nation's history. And that's a good thing for us. So now it's all about building on the institutional relationships among governments. And that's how you define a mature diplomatic relationship is it's not just a, di a relationship between presidents at the top. It's how do your ministries and your, your governments interact on a regular disciplined fashion to produce results for your people. And I'm very pleased to say that we are in the process of making that shift. Our, our fours are working well together and we're back to putting points on the board after a couple of months of getting used to this period of transition. Ambassador Forster? Yeah, that, that's a great summary uh, by Ambassador Chapman. And look, uh, you know, we said it before the election here in the US and uh, we are vindicated by the facts today that the strategic character of our bilateral relationship on both ways, you know, the importance of the US for Brazil, from, from, for Brazil to the US, that it does not change with elections. It's a, it's a bit, bit larger than this or that political party. And of course, you know, the close relationship between heads of state can help, can uh, bring an element of uh, you know, dynamism. As, as Todd mentioned, you know, we, there's this sense, this realization that Brazil and US relations have uh, over time perhaps underperformed, been below potential. And you know, we caught up a little bit in, 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 in recent years. But at the end of the day, what counts is you know, the fact that we all have almost 200 years of very close relations 
Uh, it's something Brazil does not have with any other country, not even with our close uh, South American friends uh, with uh, whom we, we had a couple of skirmishes you know, over, uh, over 150 years ago. So we don't have this uninterrupted uh, line of friendship that we have with the United States in which we're going to celebrate uh, the bicentennial in two years. But there's more than that. You know, that, that with that history comes, you know, the fact that we fought together in World War II, the fact that uh, the, the first Brazilian Republican constitution was largely inspired by, by the American constitution. There are so many things that bring us together. But at the end of the day, it's the values that count. You know, we are the two largest democracies in the Western hemisphere and we share, when I say we, it's not only the federal government, our societies, you know, our very vibrant societies share deeply uh, respect for democracy, for the rule of law, for the respect for human rights, for economic freedom. These are values we cherish and we share with the United States. That's what brings us together. And of course, when you go, you know, as a, as a former professional diplomat, you know very well that those things percolate and they are at the basis of what we do. And I think a point could be made that the values have become even more important in, in recent years, not less, as some people would argue. And that it's, uh, it's that common foundation that enables us to proceed in a very, in a very ambitious agenda that goes all the way from defense and military cooperation to ex space exploration, through education, science, technology, energy, the environment, and, and so on. That's great. Let's, uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> Todd Chapman, is, are, is business, are trade relations, commercial relations returning to normal? We're, we're, first of all, were they impacted at all? Um, you know, are US investors lined up outside the embassy? Yeah. You know, the, the, COVID, the COVID year, last year was a tough year economically uh, for the world, for our bilateral trade relationship, trade was down. Uh, but what's been very interesting to see, because uh, I left here in 2014 and then to come back six years later, is to see, Charles, how U.S. investor interest in Brazil remains very high. Uh, we are the largest investors in the country by far. According to the central bank, the value of U.S. investments here are $145 billion. The second is Spain, like down at 56 billion, and China's down at 28 billion. So people have this impression that, oh, others are investing in Brazil and the US is not. That's just not the case. Uh, we have over 400 of the 500 Fortune 500 companies here in Brazil. And also the, the real exciting aspect of investment right now into Brazil is in the area of venture capital. Uh, according to the, the Venture Capital Association for Latin America in the US, 60% uh, of all venture capital coming into Latin America from the United States is coming to Brazil. And in the last three years alone, including last year, every year that amount is doubling. And this year, uh, I've been told by venture capital firms it just continues the excitement for the Brazilian market is great. Brazil has 17 unicorns, startups over a billion dollars. Hmm. Uh, Mexico and Colombia just got their first ones. So, I mean, Brazil is the market for venture capital, for fintech, for just a, a whole range of issues that are of interest to US investors. And one of the exciting things too, Charles, the Brazilian companies are investing in the United States. Well, that's, and that, and now you're jumping in. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. <laughs> give, okay. me a chance, give me a chance here, man. Uh, okay, go ahead. Master Forrester, I'm going to ask you the same question. Are Brazilian companies coming to the U.S.? Or are they knocking on your door? They Oh, they are. Oh, they are. Uh, you, you have had an increase. If you look at the past decade, we usually don't work with decades, but look, in the past 10 years, Brazilian investment in the U.S. has been multiplied by four. Okay, 400% mm -hmm. increase uh, to the tune of, I, I don't know, it's, uh, it's almost twice as much China has invested in Brazil. So just to give a term of comparison, generating many jobs, creating opportunities here in Brazil, increasingly, uh, Ambassador Shapiro, what we see is Brazilian companies are interested either in partnering or you know, in entering the American mar market as a platform to, to join the world market and yeah. in, in, you know, increase their productivity, technology, et cetera. So this is a phenomenon, an ongoing thing, which is very positive for, for both countries. And that highlights you know, something we achieved the US about the pandemic. Even, even though we had this terrible pandemic and we had a slowdown in trade, as Todd mentioned, even so, we were able to negotiate three trade agreements uh, that we just signed last October 
and which are now, uh, you know, before the Brazilian Congress for consideration, trade facilitation and good regulatory practices, anti-corruption measures, etc., which should, you know, enable us to continue to 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 build up. And I think we all agree, if there is one area where we've been historically perhaps below potential, is the whole area of trade and investment. Even though the U.S. has been the number one and consistently so historically in the Brazilian market, you know, I think we could do more. And I think we see this, what we're doing, that these agreements as paving the way to a, a more ambitious, a deeper trade agreement. And we have seen, uh, uh, you know, very broad support coming from people I talked to here in the US, from my Brazilian friends, you know, trade associations uh, and so on in Brazil, uh, strongly supporting the idea that we should seek a closer economic alliance between the two largest economies in the Americas. And perhaps the time has come for that, you know, it's not something for the short term, we don't see the appetite there on the hill for a short-term uh, uh, approach to this. But, uh, you know, for the medium horizon, a couple of years, we're fully rebounding from the pandemic and so on. I think it will become even clearer the importance of the two largest democracies in the Americas joining together also in the economic realm. Wow, 20 years ago, maybe it was 30, we were working on the free, no, this was in the Bush 41 administration. We're working on the free trade area of the Americas in, uh, it faltered because Brazil decided not to participate. So it, it, it's, it's interesting to, if we could go back and build really, really closer relationships, I think it'd be tremendous for, for both countries. Um, I've, I've got one more question for both of you, but I want to tell the audience, the way we're going to do this today, if you've got a question is raise your hand, not physically, but go to the, go to the mute button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then you go to chat, click on chat, and then there should be down at the bottom of that somewhere, there's a raise your hand. And if you do that, I should be able to see that you've raised your hand so I can call on you. Um, just, in, in, I, I was ambassador of Venezuela. I can't end this without a question on Venezuela. I know that Brazil has, which borders Venezuela, um, has admitted thousands and thousands of Brazilian, excuse me, Venezuelan refugees into Brazil. How are, U.S. and Brazil collaborating on, on Venezuela. Can I start on? Yes, please. Yeah. Look, we've we had great cooperation, great bilateral cooperation on this issue, you know, uh, which is of concern for two of us. First, you know, on the, the, the very basic level, both Brazil and the U.S. agree that we need, you know, democratic transition in Venezuela with, with free and fair and transparent elections, you know, that the Venezuelan people should, should lead this transition. And we've been working together in that regard, you know, supporting the interim uh, government of uh, uh, President uh, uh, Guaido, uh, putting pressure, multilateral pressure upon the dictatorship of Maduro, and also trying to, to bring relief to the Venezuelan people. And that's where, you know, we have a great partnership with the US AID and Brazil has, you know, with the Operation Acolida, we say in Portuguese, Operation Welcome, uh, in which we are partnering with, with the US and other agencies. Uh, we have received over 260,000 uh, Venezuelans who we welcome at the border, we document these people, you know, they get their vaccines, that there's a, the whole health issue, and then they are brought uh, uh, to Southern Brazil where economic opportunity is, where the jobs are, so they can integrate in society. It's something that has been uh, praised, uh, you know, in the multilateral institutions and so on, as, as a model of how to receive, you know, uh, refugees in, in this very dire situation. So we're, we're proud of that. And that uh, we'll continue to work with the US and other uh, like-minded countries to try to support the democratic transition to our great neighbor to the north, you know, the great people of Venezuela. Todd, would you like to add to that? Yeah, we have worked extremely well with the Brazilian government on issues related to Venezuela. As Ambassador Forster mentioned, Brazil has been a very welcoming nation for Venezuelan refugees that have come here and the United States has provided uh, tens of millions of dollars in assistance to the overall effort but really it's the Brazilian government and people who have borne most of the expense and most of the effort. I was up in Roraima, which is the Brazilian state which borders Venezuela last September uh, for three days, uh, welcoming former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to the region. And we were able to go through the uh, different camps and setups that Brazil has set up. And I tell you, it's, it's just first rate. And we all are hoping for the same thing which is a, a democratic process that is credible uh, for the people of Venezuela to get to express themselves and for the tremendous misery uh, to finally be drawn to a close. It, this is a humanitarian disaster. 
And as you know well, Ambassador Shapiro, this is the largest, the largest refugee flow we have seen in our hemisphere in decades, if not ever. And it's just a disaster and it's a man-made disaster. And it's time for a democratic transition in Venezuela to take place. Yeah, it's six million Venezuelans have fled their country. That's uh, one, so fifth, one fifth of the population of, of, of Venezuela. So I mean, it's huge yeah. putting a, and putting a huge burden on on Brazil, on Colombia, on the, the, lots of countries, both in South America, but also in, in Central America. Sure. Um, I've got a question here from Lauren Call, and it says, Brazil has been known to be a very protectionist country, both entering the country because of tariffs, duties, and the Brazil cause, um, and also costs and shipping products within the country, from manufacturing plants in the country to uh, elsewhere in the country as, as products cross state borders. So, um, Ambassador Forster, how, how is that? I mean, how difficult is it to do business in Brazil for foreign companies? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of preaching to the converter here. You know, the business people who are joining us here today know this uh, firsthand. We have a saying in Brazil, which, which I uh, tend to subscribe, Ambassador Shapiro, which is this, uh, you know, considering what, what the, 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 the person who asked the question just said, you know, how closed our economy still is to the external world and uh, you know, the tremendous amount of red tape and inefficiencies built in, into our system. The most important free trade agreement that, the, that Brazil could negotiate would not be with uh, China or even the pending one with the European Union, which we already wrapped up, uh, not with the United States, but with Brazil itself. You know, that's what we need to do. And the, the, the good news is that we never had, in, in my ex professional experience, I, I've never seen such a good alignment between the private sector, the federal government in Brazil, our American friends in the private sector and, and, and the government in trying to you know, uh, build up uh, market mechanisms in Brazil, open up the economy. And we are seeing that with economic reform and what's being done. You know, we're, we're, we're taking strides. We just opened up the gas market. That's uh, the, the big, uh, the big uh, tax reform before Congress. Uh, the administrative reform, into the pension reform. We need to do more of that. There's been a uh, unilateral opening, uh, you know, reduction or elimination of tariffs across many, many goods, including related to the to the pandemic. We do to do, we need to do more. You know, there's a whole discussion on the role of uh, Mercosur in this. Mercosur was, you know, originally created to be a platform for increased uh, competitiveness in Brazil. Unfortunately, it was distorted to some extent and then became some sort of a, a protection mechanism. And we are very much engaged with our, our friends, you know, in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and so on, to try to, to move forward to, to kind of recuperate the original idea and use it as a way to open up to the world, increase competitiveness of the Brazilian industry and of our neighbors. And is China Brazil's largest trade partner? I mean, there's so much in the, in the US news about China and Latin America. How concerned should we be about China in, in Brazil? China has become Brazil's largest trading partner if you measure it by volume, by dollar which used volume. To be, which used to be us, right? Which used to be us until about 10 years ago, this changed. So this is not something that is, that is brand new, but what I try to characterize uh, for people is to understand what kind of trade are we talking about? The trade that Brazil has increased so dramatically with China is on three products and they're all commodities. And that re represents 94 to 95% of Brazil's exports are in the commodities of, uh, of uh, soybeans, uh, corn, and, and iron ore. And so these, these are the products that they're shipping to China. Over half of the products that Brazil trades with the United States are in finished goods and manufactured products. And one thing that I always like to point out is that as much as a third of the trade that goes on between Brazil and the US is intra-company trade, which demonstrates how integrated the, the production lines are between John Deere USA and John Deere Brazil, or General Motors USA, General Motors Brazil. And a lot of that trade is intra-company. And that just demonstrates the maturity of the relationship. So while it is true that China now has the largest dollar volume in terms of trade. When it comes to job generation, 
we all know that what creates jobs in Brazil is not exporting uh, raw materials with no value added to them. It's really the manufactured trade that is more important for creating the kinds of value chains that Brazil wants. And so that's the kind of trade that we continue to pursue. And we are working with the Brazilian government in a number of areas to try and reduce barriers to trade. It's still not an easy market, that's for sure. But when I meet with American companies, uh, large ones, and I say, so how do you deal with all these changes and all that? They said, well, we deal with it because this is still an incredibly profitable market for US companies. So if any of your members are considering doing business in Brazil, even with the headlines you read, even though it's a challenging market to work in, it's also a very profitable market to enter into. Well, this, this is, I guess for both of you, for Fortune, five, for Fortune 500 companies can figure out how to get around that, right? So you, you, you right, Caterpillar, John Deere, you, you name it. Yeah. How do small and medium-sized U.S. companies do in Brazil? Are they there? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll jump on that one first. Increasingly, they are, Ambassador Shapiro, and I'll, I'll go first with the smaller companies. Smaller companies do best when they find a Brazilian partner because to come to Brazil and figure out tax law, labor law, it's, it's a heavy investment, it really is. And so I am seeing an increasing move towards small companies in niche markets coming down here, sometimes making a Brazilian acquisition. Uh, I've seen some medical service providers do that, or they partner with a local company. And that is, that is the way I would counsel uh, smaller companies to do it, uh, because uh, this is not an easy place to, to figure out. And so that, that's what I'm seeing happening uh, at the uh, smaller company level. Hey, Ambassador Forster, let me ask you about climate issues. I mean, that was one of those areas where the whole world has been lecturing Brazil about what to do. And uh, Brazil, of course, doesn't like being lectured at any more than anyone else. Um, how, how has that worked with the new administration in the United States? And as we get ready for the uh, climate conference that's going to take place in, I think it's in Glasgow, is it not in November? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, how, how, what, what's happening with Amazon? What's happening with, with the rest of the world's concern? What's happening with Brazil? Um, can, can you talk about that for a second? Sure, sure. Look, Ambassador Shapiro, we, we advocated, you know, considering uh, the tremendous emphasis that has been given uh, by the Biden administration, everything has to do with climate change and the environmental issues. We have uh, uh, sought a very early engagement uh, w with the new administration and uh, specifically with the Special Envoy for Climate Change, uh, former Secretary John Kerry. And I carried that, uh, that uh, message myself from President Bolsonaro. It was very well received and we established a high level dialogue uh, between the former secretary and uh, our foreign minister and also our minister for the environment. And we have a series of meetings from, uh, you know, at the technical level that have taken place in the past two months. And uh, we continue to, to, to explore ways uh, in which we can do things together, both at the bilateral level, at the multilateral level. Now, you know, uh, Brazil gets some of a uh, bad press on this and uh, some of the facts, some of the facts get, you know, perhaps uh, 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 involved in too much smoke and we, we don't get what's going on. And so we would like to remember, remind people of the credentials that Brazil brings to the table for this dialogue and for this cooperation with, with the United States. You know, Brazil has the largest biodiversity in our planet. Brazil has two thirds, two thirds of our territory is still covered by its original vegetation. The US posts some 20% and uh, you know, many of our European uh, friends have less than 1% of their native vegetation. If you put together preserved environmental areas in Brazil, the ones that are protected by law, with indigenous people's uh, reservations, you end up with protected areas that uh, amount to um, about 30% of our territory. Brazil has a total of 6.3% of the land mass in the world, 6.3%, but we have 12.2% of all protected areas in the planet. To top, to top that, to top that, we talk a lot about the energy transition and so on. And Brazil, if we look, you know, uh, dispassionately at what we've been doing, 
the zoo was at the vanguard of doing this because we began the, the, our energy transition program in the 1970s with hydropower and with uh, uh, what ended up being our ethanol program. So, you know, uh, Brazil has 46% uh, uh, of all the energy we consume comes from renewable sources. If we take only the electric sector, it's 82%. So you see Brazil is where many countries, including very advanced economies want to be. Uh, Brazil is responsible for less than 3% of all greenhouse uh, emissions. So, you know, that's not to say that everything's perfect in a paradise. We have challenges there uh, in the Amazon with deforestation that has been going on, uh, going up since 2012. Uh, people try to pin this, pin this up in the current administration. This is silly. It's been going on for 12 years, including the past two years. But never before have we done so much to fight deforestation, fight illegal deforestation, fight illegal mining. And that's one of the, the goals of our joint cooperation with our American friends is to see ways in which we can work together, uh, you know, to bring, uh, uh, to bring good opportunities for the 25 million Brazilians who live in the Amazon through bioeconomy, you know, from ecotourism, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, agriculture, the tremendous fish of the Amazon. They need to be discovered, you know, the tucunaré, pirarucu, tambaqui, it's delicious. I bet Ambassador Chapman has already tried them. You know, we should bring this because this will bring opportunity for the people who live there and, you know, provide them with an alternative to the illegal activities, which are very, very profitable. You know, the illegal logging, the illegal mining and, and so on. So we, we remain very much committed. And uh, President Bolsonaro just had the great opportunity in the Leaders Summit uh, convened by President Biden now in, at the end of April to reaffirm those credentials and bring new, new commitments to the table, you know eliminating all illegal uh, deforestation in Brazil by 2030, of completing energy transition, you know, uh, net zero in Brazil by 2050. I think we were the first developing nation to, to, to have this level uh, of, of commitment brought to the table, among other things that we have committed to do. So, you know, I think it's, it's a, a, a great positive for our bilateral relationship and for the contribution that Brazil has traditionally given on, on the ground with uh, the conditions I just presented and also through our diplomatic efforts in supporting negotiations around the world in all the, the many, many environmental instruments we have. Oh, that's great. That's a great answer. I, I know the audience has got more questions. I promise you, you would only be on for 45 minutes, Ambassador Forster. Um, we're going to end the large part of the program today and move to the uh, members only session with Ambassador Chapman. If we were clever, we could figure out how to do it with uh, with two breakout rooms and both of you, but we're not that clever yet. Hope to be soon. I want to thank both of you for joining us. I want to thank the audience. We have a large audience today. Uh, to the audience members, I've got three requests. First, join the World Affairs Council as an individual or as a corporate member. You don't have to live in Atlanta. We've got digital membership. Be delighted to have you. Secondly, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll post the recording of today's conversation within a couple of hours. And you can see our other conversations as well. And please invite your friends to join one of our programs. Here's what we've got coming up is on the 25th at noon, we've got a program on systemic racism and policing, which by the way, is not a problem only in the United States, but elsewhere around the world with uh, Dr. Paul Butler from Georgetown University Law Center, Dave Wilkinson, CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation, Linda Williams, the president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, our board chair, Bernard Taylor, who's an attorney and is also a former police officer in his youth, will, will actually moderate the session. On the 26th of May, we've got the ambassador of Germany to the United States. And June 1, 2, and 3, we have our annual Global Health Summit. The topic this year, of course, is the race to beat COVID-19. It will be from noon to 1.30 p.m. each day, June 1, on how to respond to the food security crisis globally and at home. On June 2nd, which is uh, Wednesday, can vaccines win the race against variants and misinformation? And on Thursday, June 3rd, what are the essential reforms we all must make to avoid the next pandemic? So I hope you will all join us for their, those upcoming programs. I want to thank YKK America for sponsoring today's program. I want to thank our partner, the Brazil America Chamber of Commerce Southeast. I want to thank Bruno Rezende from the Brazilian Embassy in Washington and Todd 
Mia Rija from the U.S. Embassy in Brasilia, who have helped us put this together. And then I want to thank on our staff, Valerie Lopez DeFrank, our producer, Laura Brower, assistant producer, Hannah Rennie, our interim program director, and give a big welcome to our new intern, Josephine Steenbergen, whose first day is today. Thank you again, Ambassador Nestor Foster, Todd Chapman, I want you to hold on and we are somehow miraculously going to be transported into a breakout room where we will continue with our members and I want to urge everybody to become a member so that you can you can join next time. Thank you all very much. This, this has been great. If you're going to the breakout room, I think you're supposed to stay on the line. Otherwise, I hope you all all have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Thank Mr. Forster. Appreciate it very Thank much. You. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you, Master Chapel. Thank you.